No, skepticism is awesome. There it's you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. Welcome everyone to the panel. This is educating versus debunking, and we're going to try to focus on uh, two big overarching discussion points for the panel. One is basically the, the old argument in skepticism. Uh, what's the difference between debunking and open-minded inquiry, open-minded skepticism, and then how this plays out in the classroom. Uh, for those of you involved in education, um, are you open about your beliefs? Do you tell people what to believe? Or is it all about open-minded inquiry? So to start off, I'd like each of our panelists, starting with Michael Blandford here, who's Director of Educational Programs at the JREF, uh, to each uh, do a short introduction and uh, then just answer the simple question, is it good as skeptics to debunk nonsense? Or to put it another way, What's so wrong with debunking? I mean, isn't that our business? Aren't we debunkers? That's the question. Okay. Um, and my name's Michael Blanford, and uh, you know, I, I I guess we like to talk, um, you know, particularly at the JRF, because a lot of people talk about you know critical thinking or some of these broad things. Um, our mission's a little more focused, so we're particularly concerned with you know raising awareness about uh, you know extraordinary claims of the paranormal or the supernatural, and so. We talk very specifically about some specific claims, um, and it, in, in some sense, it may come off as debunking. You know, we have kind of specific things to say about about specific topics. So we may talk about something like dowsing, um, but I don't. In, in an educational context, context, I'm not sure how much we care about. Well, is it important that kids either believe or, or disbelieve in the claims of dowsing? But I think. You know, talking about these specific topics can be great tools for getting them to, um, you know, sort of a, a approach sort of these these broader topics with some of the tools that they gain from that. So, um, you know, not debunking, but I think you know a good example is um, looking at something like the Cottingley Fairies. I don't know how familiar people are with that, but we can talk about um, Arthur Conan Doyle. And you know, Cottingley Fairies is not a very relevant topic today. You know, it's 90 years ago. Um, it, you know, may seem kind of trivial, but it, it gives us this door to talk with kids about something like the, the role of um, celebrity in, in how we evaluate claims that are out there. And something that we can look at today with somebody like Jenny McCarthy. Um, you know, what value does you know, the things she says about, um, about you know, a real serious topic like vaccination. Um, so it sort of op opens the door mm. you know, to be able to talk about these specific things that, you know, and we do have this sort of laundry list of topics that we talk about again and again, ghosts and, and dousing and all these things. But I think they are great tools to um, you know, sort, of, sort of give that intellectual tool set that I think we probably all agree that you know, kids benefit from having. Mm. Kylie? Hi. Uh, is this working? Hello. I'm Kylie Sturgis of the Token Skeptic Podcast. Um, when I try to introduce myself, uh, I... Oh, don't clap. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing. Uh, when I introduce myself, I generally say I'm a religious education teacher who married her dungeon master. Uh, <laughs> it's absolutely true. I teach in the religious education department of an Anglican school in Australia. I teach philosophy and ethics to final, high school, uh, final year high school students. Uh, I was the MC of the Global Atheist Convention. I did tell my place of employment, they hired me anyway. Uh, and uh, in terms of education and debunking, I think that debunking does have a place, but it's not equal to education. I think mm. that there are a great many messages and a great many ideas that out there that do need to be debunked, but it's not the same as education. Mm. In terms of education, we're leading people to understand how to think rather than what to think, but it doesn't completely invalidate the power of debunking. Right. Let me focus the question uh, just a bit. Um, to what extent do you believe the argument that a lot of skeptics make that debunking is kind of closed-minded and skepticism is open-minded? In other words, drawing a distinction between skepticism and debunking. Matt? Hi, my name is Matt Lowry. Uh, I teach high school and college physics north of Chicago, and uh, I also run a blog called The Skeptical Teacher, uh, skepticalteacher.org, where I muse about all kinds of topics like this. Um, I think the question of whether or not debunking is appropriate largely depends upon the context in which 
uh, these, you know, debunking, so to speak, is being done. Um, because I can draw upon experiences in my own classroom where I, I deal with the physics of certain topics uh, that have a segue into skeptical and critical thinking uh, in terms of paranormal claims, for example. Um, and I think a lot of it depends upon how you approach it. I mean, there are some, some things that are obviously nonsense, you know, flat earth and, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, when you are dealing with a topic and you don't really know what's in the students' heads, I think that it does benefit trying to approach in more of a, a, a questioning manner instead of trying to, you know, start off, you know, obviously this is wrong. And what you do is you take them, like what Kylie was saying, you take them through the, the logical processes and the way I do it is I do a lot of demonstrations and whatnot. And then, and then, you know, lead them to a point where they have to draw a conclusion. And much of the time they'll, they'll draw what I consider to be the appropriate conclusion. Um, but you don't begin with that. No, I, I it, again, it depends upon the context of the specific thing you're looking at, but I think that uh, that can have a place, but it does depend upon the specific context. And it's also culturally specific, too. I mean, for example, uh, if you are a, a, a biology teacher in the Deep South, for example, um, that can be a sticky wicket uh, sometimes, <laughs> dealing with the whole uh, evolution creationism thing. Um, so uh, that would be a, a situation where I would say taking the, you know, the former approach of that I mentioned, you know, leading them through the questioning process versus just kind of outright, you know, closing the door and, and saying debunking would, might, might be more appropriate. Hi. Uh, hello. My name is Brian Hart, and I'm with the Independent Investigations Group in Los Angeles. I'm um, one of the founding members, actually, and uh, we have affiliates now. But um, I, I'm not an educator like everybody here on the panel, except uh, part of our uh, credo is to educate the public to the, to the things we find out. We test claims of the paranormal, uh, people like that. Um, the, the term that I've come recently to like a lot is to be an advocate of science literacy. Mm. And that's just a nice, nice term. It's, it's, it's not negative at all. It actually comes uh, from my wife's family. My wife's from... Uh, her family's from Atlanta. They came up with that term, and I went, okay, that's a good term. I like that one. Um, and I just want to talk just for a second about bunk, uh, and, and I do like the term bunk, and I know what Joe Nick would say if he was here, but, but here, here's the problem. The old-fashioned word was, uh, I remember the old um, Dragnet episode, and they go, we work in the bunko squad. Mm. And, and, and that literally meant, you know, they're going after phony gypsies and phony gypsies, so, you know, phony fortune tellers, things like that. Um, so I actually, you know, in, in a discussion yesterday with uh, Mark Edward, Blake, Blake Smith, we said, you know, where, where does that term come from? And I, and I found that really interesting. Um, it comes from North Carolina. There was a, there was a, a, a county, there is a county there called Buncombe County, B-U-N-C-O-M-B-E County. And there was a, a House of Representative guy named uh, uh, Felix Walker, and I couldn't find out what his, what his uh, Republican, uh, whether he was Republican or what. I think it was pre-Republican, actually. Anyway, um, he would give these long, long speeches uh, that were meaningless. And um, the, the term was long and wearisome speeches for Buncombe County. Mm. So if you're speaking for Buncombe or Buncombe, that's, that's where that comes from. Um, and then, then in, in uh, Washington, that just became uh, the term Buncombe, which then started being spelled B-U-N-K-U-M, uh, just means meaningless political claptrap. Mm. And then later on, it became uh, any kind of nonsense. And, and just this morning, I just thought about that one place I want to check. Uh, went out to Wiki, and I looked up the word debunk. And it says, to discredit or expose to ridicule the falsehood or exaggerated claims of something. Okay, that's exactly what we're doing. Exactly. So I say we reclaim the word, mm. bunk or debunk. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't know it was lost. But, um. <laughs> well, but surely you'd acknowledge there's some resistance to yes. using yes. the term right. within uh, the skeptics movement. Uh, right. Yes, and I, and I think that, that some of that comes from not really... Um, thinking about the context in which it's used. And debunking really is, to me anyway, it, it's an expert evaluation of something with a specific knowledge set. So if, if I want to know whether or not a claim is true, I have some choices. I can try to find out by learning the literature of the field that the claim <laughs> comes from. Sometimes that can take years. Um, I can ask somebody, you know, I know, how do I trust them? But an expert can debunk something for me by showing me what's 
you know, an alternative explanation. Mm. And, you know, something as simple as a magician debunking a psychic, it's simply by, um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't introduce myself, Barbara Drescher, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and You're an educator, a college professor. Yeah, I, I taught uh, co um, cognitive psychology and research methods and so forth for about 10 years at CSU Northridge. And I do a lot of this in the classroom. I'm teaching a science. The students don't have all of the information yet. It takes a long time to learn about a lot of myths that we have in psychology. I mean, understanding what hip hypnotism does um, and where the, the myths are. So sometimes they have to have the facts before they can learn how to figure out the facts themselves. Mm. You can't make decisions about your life you know, in terms of alternative medicine. How do you know whether light therapy really works? Debunking is, is something that we have to do in order to provide information for people who wouldn't otherwise be able to evaluate it simply because they don't have the knowledge set or they don't have it yet. So you would say in your classroom you've unapologetically debunked. Brian talked about advocating science science literacy, mm -hmm. um, science awareness, kind of knowing uh, science, but when we talk about science, science can both be a method of inquiry, but it could also be a body of knowledge, and if you're talking about science being a body of knowledge, you're talking about, uh, what's the metaphor, you know, opening up the students' noggins and putting stuff in there, which is kind of antithetical to this long argument in pedagogy, which is not teaching content but teaching methods. So that's the next question True. Um, about this uh, Can I skepticism. Can say something about that real quick? It, sure, please. Sometimes the content's important to, because they already have conceptions about it, and sometimes those are misconceptions. And so if you think you already have a, a set of knowledge, you're not open to the knowledge that's there. So sometimes you have to introduce you know, bits of knowledge and then show how you got it, how you got there. So first you want to kind of wipe the slate clean so you can yeah. teach process or method. Mm -hmm. um, well, so I like to. The, yeah. the, well, I do both at the same time. Okay, yeah. the, the, um, the old argument in education, and if we're talking about being skeptical educators, it's the kind of uh, um, tension between teaching students how to think versus teaching them what to think. Mm -hmm. and. Um, skeptics, I think, even if we give lip service to not wanting to be a debunker, not wanting to be closed-minded, all of us have almost a statement of non-beliefs. We have a position on, you know, these 10 or 12 or 20 paranormal pseudoscientific claims. And uh, so do you think it's just lip service that we say uh, it's more about method and process of inquiry, it's more important to teach students how to think than what to think, or is it this dance between the two as it seems like is being argued on this panel. Kylie? Man. Well, one of the things that immediately struck me was the comment that you made about wiping the slate clean. I don't think you ever really wipe the slate clean because it's useful to maintain some of these um, memories at least or understandings of why you came to that position mm -hmm. in the first place so you can feel that you actually learned something. Right. Oh. In terms of, oh, sorry. No, please. Yeah. In terms of uh, debunking being yeah, being the sort of standpoint, I think that mostly comes from not really understanding what um, scepticism is meant to be about. I don't think that it's really well known for many people out there to understand the basics of scepticism. And in some ways it comes across as being a simple way of getting across a message to, to debunk it in a way, just as a, a sort of a shortcut. But it's, it's not really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And it takes, as Barbara said, a lot of time in order to unpack the methods. So in some cases, it just seems almost like it's a shortcut to almost debunk or say these particular points we know as being true. But even Eugenie Scott, in a most recent lecture that she did on creationism, she said, OK, we understand these particular mm. theories. And unfortunately, some of the theories that are out there which are combating it, such as evolution, intelligent design, they're just not holding up. And so that's why we maintain the understanding of the theories of evolution. In many ways, it's just an opportunity for educators to realise that people will come to these positions in many different ways, and sometimes you do have to go for shortcuts, and mm -hmm. that might be debunking. So d in the example of evolution, it's debunking the pseudoscience of creationism or intelligent mm -hmm. design. Uh, you shouldn't be skittish about saying, here's a body of knowledge, science says, thus saith, and you're in a science class, this is what I'm teaching you. You don't have to kind of lead them piecemeal along a process and say, well, what are your beliefs? Th so that's the question. Where do you draw the line? Do you teach your students what you believe on these positions or consensus science believes, or is it all about asking them what their position is and hoping they arrive where you want them to? 
I just wanted to mention some. I'll answer that question, but I just wanted to mention something really quick, dovetailing off of a point that Kylie just made. Uh, I think misconceptions are useful. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree with her completely that you just can't wipe the slate clean. And I, I like to, in physics, if, you, if you've ever taught physics, you know that there are just misconceptions abound. And I love to use misconceptions as teaching moments um, because they're, they're useful. Because when, when a kid says something in class and they, they're clearly displaying a misconception, you can pretty much bet that you know, probably 75% of the class has got exactly the same misconception. And then you can, you can, you can hold on to that and you can use that uh, as a teaching tool. Mm. And that's very powerful for a lot of them because you know, that engages them and it gets them thinking and, 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 you're, 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 and that's the whole point is you're trying to get them to go through this thinking process. Now, um, as to your other point about you know, do you teach what you believe or, or what uh, consensus science is, well, seeing as how I basically believe pretty much the consensus science, mm -hmm. that's what I teach. Um, but I'll. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you get those tricky questions. Like uh, one of the things I love to do when I start my classes is in the very first day, as I tell uh, Carl Sagan's dragon in the garage story. You know, it's this mythical dragon in the garage, and you do all these tests to see if it's there, and the neighbor keeps rationalizing away while there's no way to detect it, and um, get them thinking about you know the 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 process of science, and that you have to make measurements and be able to 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 detect things. And I, I use that idea and I use that story all the time. And even the students start talking about it. Even they, they even start coming back to it. And I think it's, uh, I think it's important to, to, to do that, to constantly try to get them coming back and thinking about, okay, well, is this a drag in the garage or can we analyze this particular question or phenomena with physics? But it sounds like you're suggesting a method to evaluate claims rather right. than a, right. a kind of a, a statement of non-beliefs or a, a that's exactly right. That's a, exactly right. You know, doctrinaire position yeah. that all your students must adopt. Because I think that if you, at least the way I do it, I mean, if if I approach it that way, uh, for one, it's more engaging hmm. because you're talking about you know, okay, can, can do do martial artists break boards because of chi energy or is it because they just hit the boards really damn hard? <laughs> right, <laughs> and I, then we actually talk about that, and we reference the dragon in the garage story from the beginning of the year, and then I do the demonstration where I actually you, break the boards. You, you actually do, I do martial it. arts in your physics class. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I just I just break boards. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and uh, we're going to do that at the physics demo show tomorrow afternoon, five thirty, Crystal Ballroom. By the way, shameless plug. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think. I think that's important uh, because one, it engages the students, two, it already plays off their misconceptions and it gets a dialogue going. And I, I had a student come to me, and then I'll shut up here. I had a student come to me after I told the dragon in the garage story and he, had, he, he made a very cogent point. He says, well, that doesn't necessarily prove that such a dragon does not exist. And I said, that's, yeah. you're exactly right. I said, logically, what that shows is that the methods of science cannot detect this mm. thing. And then that led us to a discussion, uh, but I used that. I used that to talk to him briefly about the demarcation problem in the philosophy of science. Where does philosophy begin? Where does pseudoscience begin? Where does science end and begin? And uh, that piqued his interest. Mm. So I, I, think we have to, I think we have to hold on to those opportunities and those little misconception moments uh, and use them when we can. Mm. I just want to say before we get you know too far into that what versus how mm. question is I think it's a false dichotomy. Mm. I think that when you're teaching the what, you're teaching the how, and that and, and I think you've addressed that really well. When you're talking about misconceptions, I mean, if if you're a teacher who uses Socratic method, you're constantly asking your students to answer questions that they shouldn't know the answers to yet, and you use those misconceptions simply, or hopefully, by trying to figure out where they came from. And that teaches them their thought processes, and in the process, you're teaching, you're steering them to the right way of coming to the right answer, and showing them the bits of evidence that they don't already have, the bits of knowledge. And that's where the what comes in. Mm. So they may not know, well, there's this study that says this. And when you tell them that and work that into their current knowledge base, that gives them the power to then let go of some of those mm. misconceptions. So uh, as educators, everyone seems to be saying it's not either or. It's not process versus content, method versus content only. The, you know, in pedagogy, John Dewey's big argument, teach the children you know, how to think, not what to think. Mm -hmm. Even if cultural conservatives think he, he, you know, he single-handedly 
is responsible for indoctrinating Western students into liberalism or something. Uh, so you say it's both. Um, let's bring it back to skepticism, uh, kind of as a movement or as a subculture, because when skeptics get together at a pub gathering or we get together at a conference or something, there's very little conversation that I overhear where people are evaluating claims. And there's a lot of conversation about what we as skeptics believe in other or, or maybe one should say it what we skeptics don't believe you know that's nonsense there and that here's other nonsense here there's not a lot of as i hear it there's not a lot of open-minded inquiry what if conversation about well here's an interesting study about psychics that asks some questions that are worth looking into and in other words it's far more doctrinaire than it sounds like you guys are suggesting you're comfortable with yes <laughs> I'll just say yeah, it, and it bothers me. It, yeah. Am I wrong about that, or it's do I have also, a bias? It's also context. I mean, uh, you mentioned uh, pubs, for example. It's entirely likely that you might not want to sit down over a beer and nut out exactly mm -hmm. why you think, you know, Von Prague and Sylvia Brown are <laughs> wrong. Right. I would. Well, not all the time. Um, but at a pub, you just want to throw one more back and make fun of them. Yeah. Or, well, or some, yeah. Some I mean, yeah. Too. yeah. We are, yeah. we are human, exactly. yeah, it is community after all. Um, but certainly um, in opportunities like conferences or lectures, I mean, if it's skeptics in the pub, it shouldn't just be, well, certainly not my experience, it's not just sit together as a community. We often have sit together community and we have a lecture, we have a talk, we have a, a book um, club, for example, is a great one, because then you can unpack and say, oh, I didn't actually realise this before and hear the reasons. Did anyone else come up with right, a different right. idea as to why they reached a similar sort of point of view or why they don't really agree with the author at all? Right. But to the extent that any of those grassroots activities, and mm -hmm. I don't want to hang my hat on just the pub gatherings, yeah. but any like Conference local meeting, yeah. to the extent that any of them engage in outreach, you're not only speaking to people who believe or disbelieve exactly like you. Ideally, you're talking with some newbies who might show up and say, well, yeah. I don't believe in UFOs, but you know, I saw Bigfoot once, yeah. and maybe yeah. there's some conversation there, or is there? I, I guess that's I, I, the question here about education versus debunking. I think that's one of the reasons why educators have such an important role to play, because we are constantly put into a position where we are not speaking to the choir. Mm. Mm. Because every year when my students walk in the door, they're a fresh bunch. They, and I have to go through this every single year. So I have a little bit of a different perspective on this because of that experience. And so when, when I run into somebody, I, I try to, my wife tells me I'm always teaching. I never leave teacher mode. Um, it's, it's, it's a sickness, I guess. I don't know. We whatever. should start a support group for yeah. some <laughs> That's Hi, my name's Matt. That's the other skeptics in the Hi, my name's yeah. Matt. I'm a teacher. <laughs> um, hi, Matt. Yeah. No, but but seriously, I mean, I think I think because by the, the structure of our, of our profession, we are constantly put into this position where we're, we're we're dealing with people. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, I have to reset because these students haven't had these lessons yet. We haven't gone through it, and so I, they're 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 a fresh bunch, and I have to start with them from scratch. So that when when I go to a skeptics in the pub and I happen to run into somebody who believes that you know <coughs> in Bigfoot or whatever, I, I my default thinking of course is and it's on I'll, I'll say it honestly oh okay they're kind of nuts, but that's but that's my sort of cynical side. But then I kick over to my teaching mode and and I start asking them questions, mm -hmm. and I think. That's where kind of right. there's a difference because I think most people that you meet, so the skeptics in the pub type events, they're people like us. And I think the reason why you get some of that conversation about, oh, they're nuts and, and all this sort of stuff is because a lot of us that have gone to these events have dealt with this so much. Hmm. And uh, we already know what's going on. Right. Versus well, and, and right. in group out group thinking people. kind of intensifies the community. Right, and right. It's the, us yeah. and them is maybe sociologically right. natural. I don't but, know. But. but you're also talking about mindfulness. I mean, more recently the JREF came out with the code of conduct, for example. And so that's almost like a meta level mm -hmm. of what's going on at a conference or a skeptics mm -hmm. in the pub and so forth. And so encouraging mindfulness is something that should be done as a civil activity anyway. I mean, uh, talking about skeptics in the pub, this wasn't at a skeptics in the pub that I attended, but it was an atheist in the pub. Mm -hmm. And um, a 
gentleman stood up and he gave a talk about why he thought Einstein's theories were a load of rubbish. Mm. And um, I was surrounded by a bunch of atheists who were sort of quietly smacking their heads against their hands, saying, oh my God, yeah, he's, you know, he's talking nonsense. And I was enjoying myself thoroughly because I said, well, he's an atheist. Mm. This is atheist skeptics, you know, yeah, this right, is atheist right. in the pub, not skeptics in the pub. So, you know, this is what you get. And I listened appreciatively and we talked it out with him afterwards. I don't think we changed his mind, but in terms of he was an atheist and he was talking about atheist things, even though he completely disregarded the science in some factors, right. that was fine by me. And the fact that we were able to be mindful of not being rude to our presenter and that we were able to discuss in a respectful manner afterwards was something that we just should have done and we did do. Mm. And that's in regards to interacting with people. I hope that we do have even though we might, you know, often have the old knee jerk, you know, oh my God, have you seen the complete and utter rubbish on Channel 2 last night, right. that we will still maintain that sort of mindfulness so we don't completely and utterly alienate newcomers or even people who are intrigued or, or willing to debate and, right. and so forth. Yeah, right. I, I would agree with Kylie. Um, <coughs> not being, a, you know, a, a paid educator, I, I just feel when I'm in the public, skeptics in the pub, drinking skeptically, we have what we call um, uh, skepti dinners, that. <laughs> I'm always talking to people and listening really carefully to what they're saying. Uh, and when you start hearing someone talking nonsense, I don't just start poking and jabbing. I'm really listening. I'm really trying to figure out where they went wrong, mm. where they went wrong, or, and, or if they went wrong. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's that's a good point. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and and I'm not and I'm not yeah. looking to poke a hole in their argument. I'm really genuinely interested in, in learning, like where where is this person? You know, where do they go off the rails? And then I then I look for that little tiny crack that I see in, in there, and I kind of will poke at it a little bit. Uh, my favorite thing to do is when someone tells me they're an astrologer, and and I'll say, oh, what's that all about? And they start telling me all about the planets and the alignments and the stars, and I say, oh, so you tell me, so if, so if you knew my birthday, you would tell me all these traits about myself. Oh, absolutely. So I said, let's do it in reverse. I said, what if I tell you these traits about myself? You could then tell me my sign. <laughs> well, I, I never thought of that before. So I said, okay, uh, the only question you can't ans ask me is my sign. Every other question I'll answer as honestly as I can. Um, you know, are you this kind of person? That kind of, yes, yes, yes. By the third question, they're, they're bored and they go, oh, you're a Capricorn, aren't you? And I'll say, mm, you can't ask me that question. I said, I said I'll say, you know, <coughs> one down, 11 to go. And, 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 so, and so generally generally speaking, by the fifth or sixth question, they're like, oh, you must be a Sagittarius because you're so blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, you happen to be wrong. But so, so, so I feel like I'm educating right. them in a slight way and and the, the, the several times I've done it one person came back to me a little like a couple months later and said you know I've been trying to figure that out what's wrong with that so that's my that's my idea of education we're always educated yeah I, I, I think, think I think right. it's important to note that in venues like that that in many in many cases you when you do engage in that kind of dialogue with somebody it's important to realize that you're not in a vacuum I mean mm -hmm. there are other people yeah. who are watching the conversation and even that's if you're not able to good, convince good that yeah. person like in your story the astrology even if you're not able to convince that person the, the people who watch the conversation many times do walk away going, hmm, you know, that's a good point. I've had that happen so many times when I get into conversations with students after class or even in class. You know, the, the kid may still walk away disagreeing, but a lot of other students will be like, you know, that was really, that was, that, that's really making me think about some things. So uh, you have to always remember it's, the audience is just bigger than who you're talking yeah. to. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the, getting back to the fill plate, uh, don't be a, uh, a dick. Which I think is important because if you come across like you're a jerk, they're going to stop listening to you instantly. So, so it's, yeah. it's a, it is a fine line, mm. yeah. very fine line. Uh, Michael, do you have any thoughts about the um, kind of indoctrination notion that a skeptic begins with positions and just wants other people to adopt them versus the method? Um, sure. Well, I, you know, I, I think you know we use a lot of these topics, especially in, in the ed educational setting because they're really compelling topics to kids. You know, you go in an elementary school library, and, um, and I still remember from when I was a kid where it is in the Dewey Decimal System or whatever, and you know, there'll be 50 books on ghosts, I mean, spontaneous human combustion, Bigfoot <laughs> UFOs. And that's because you know, kids are nuts about these topics. Right. Well, I mean, everybody is, right. a lot of people are. So it, it's this real luxury we have to have the starting point, all right, you know, you know, let's let's talk about something and sort of unravel this mystery, and it's something that's really bizarre and strange. Um, so, and, and the process is where the real goods are, um, and I think so if you can just get started talking about the process, you know, it really works. And if you want to see an example of that, um, you know, you come here to the Skeptrack, go to a talk by Joe Nickel, you know, about alien abduction or something. 
then walk over to the paranormal track and where they're offering the same topic. And you'll really see that, you know, Joe's as nuts about monsters, as aliens, you know, as, as those guys are, but, you know, here's where the real story is, the sort of, you know, the, the process and the real goods, and it's far more compelling. It's not, you go over there, I mean, you know, or watch a ghost hunting show, you know, if you can sit through five minutes of it. <laughs> I mean, and it's not oh, just because it's nonsense, because I'll watch some of it's nonsense, it's yeah. just, they there's walk nothing around with compelling to it. Mm. They walk around with a meter and say, oh, look, the needle moved. They, yeah. yeah, it's they, a bad they, version they, of the Blurry they Witch Project. Turn out project. the lights and scare themselves. That's yeah. the show. Turn out the lights and scare themselves. Yeah. I, I love what you mentioned about the compelling topics of uh, pseudoscience as being useful oh, yeah. for educators. In Bible college, my freshman year, I'm in a survey of psychology, uh, and the the uh, professor starts talking about this is like in, at, at religious school. Starts talking UFOs, demonology, that sort of stuff. And I thought it was kind of a little off topic, but everyone was wrapped, right? Just sitting on the edge of their seats. Later, in an educational psychology course, uh, a couple years later, he kind of called back to that and he said, you know, that was kind of manipulative, but the one way to get students' attention is keep them from talking in the back of the class, really make them pay attention, talk about the spooky stuff. So we don't end there. Then we use that as a way to kind of teach the method of skepticism. And Michael's very humble, but he and his team wrote uh, this education module. Many of the team are on this panel right now, the education advisory panel for uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation. This is a module for educators we provide free uh, to any teachers around the country uh, for use in their classrooms, and it doesn't Notice it, it, it doesn't begin with an answer. It asks a question, do you have ESP? And it lets students conduct an experiment to test whether or not they have ESP. And there's discussion about statistics and uh, the methodology. Uh, so at the JREF, we like the phrase, if you have answers, we have questions, as opposed to come to us for the answers. And uh, w w would you say that from some of the feedback we've had, this approach seems to work? Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, ESP, it's a you know, topic everybody's interested right. in. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's not an, you're not going to conduct an exhaustive scientific study in your classroom, but it gets you started in thinking about, you know, experimental design and, and how tricky it can be to test some of these things. And, you know, even the question, <coughs> is, is that a scientific question? You know, is that something we can test? So that's, those are the kinds of things you, you get people started talking about. And, um, you know, hopefully you, you have a teacher that can sort of, you know, keep the discussion going and, um, you know, uh, keep it relevant to other things they're teaching. So yeah, it's, it's a starting place mm. more than anything. Uh, th this is free. It's a free resource the Randy Foundation makes available. So uh, they are available at the JREF table in the back of, on, on this floor. So be sure to come by and, and take a gander. One, one more uh, discussion point before we open it up to audience questions. And that's this, uh, uh, what I think is, if you'll allow me to kind of speak personally for a moment, one of the weaknesses of the skeptics movement is really what we've been talking about during the panel discussion today, which is that for many skeptics, some of my best friend skeptics, skepticism is a weapon you bludgeon other people's nonsense <laughs> beliefs <laughs> with, as opposed to kind of skepticism is best self-applied. And so my question, if you could answer briefly, and then we'll go to audience questions. Um, let's start down here with Barbara. What's an example of a belief you used to have that you no longer have, and was it debunked out of you, or did you do it to yourself because you kind of were skeptical? In other words, did someone jostle your nonsense belief out of you? Uh, so it's kind of a, a hot seat question, but yeah. see if you could come up with one example. Um, yeah, well, that'll work, yeah. That, that, that is a tough question because I, I think I've always been skeptical, but I was also a believer. I mean, I became a skeptic basically because there was somebody in a new you know, Bay Area skeptics right after it was formed, visited my high school psychology class, wow. right after a psychic had, had been there, and showed us how she did it, but he spent the first hour pretending he was a psychic, and then he, he dropped the bomb. And I had spent most of my childhood reading all those books you were talking about, <laughs> on you know, spontaneous human combustion and so forth, and, and I was a believer, but I kept looking for the evidence. So I never fully believed. I couldn't find the evidence, and I think my, my problem was I always thought that you should believe in something until you have had evidence mm. against it. And oh, wow. that, the, the challenge was four years old and it was only $100,000 at the time, but to me, I was, my, I, nobody's claimed that. 
that was the convincer for me, okay? Wow. But there have been several things that I thought were true and then saw the right, just the right study that convinced me otherwise. And as a scientist, one of the most important things that a scientist can, can be is open-minded. The difference between an entirely intelligent person and a truly rational person, a consistently rational person, is an open mind. So whenever anyone uses skepticism or atheism or anything else to tell someone they're wrong, they're saying, I am right. Mm. When they're saying, you have this conclusion, therefore you are not reasonable, mm. or you are, are not rational, they're saying that they have an ultimate truth. And we don't ever prove anything in science. So that to me is, we may have overwhelming evidence, <laughs> but we talk about the evidence. If, if you say, I, I, I have a ghost in my house, I'll ask you what the evidence is and then tell you what the alternative explanations for that evidence are. I won't tell you you don't have a ghost in your house. I'll say, I'm not convinced you have a ghost in your house because I don't see the evidence. It's not convincing to me. And I'll tell you why it's not convincing. And that's a principled position, not just word games for you. I mean, Yes, you, yeah. it's a very principled, because the, sci <laughs> the integrity of science is at stake when you, when you are that arrogant. It's arrogance to me. That, right. That's the only word I have for it. It's, mm. it's arrogance. Brian, you have an answer yeah, to that question? Yeah, interesting. Um, I noticed everyone here was nodding their head on the panel when we talked about the UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, all those things. It's a phase we pass through. And, and I like to think, um, for me, uh, I read all those books. And, and for some reason, I, I was focused, I guess, because curly in photography was, was big when mm -hmm. I was a kid. So this thing where you, where you put your hand on a, on a Polaroid photograph, if you remember that, and this aura would appear around your fingertip. And I went, wow, that's pretty amazing. What is that? So I thought the human aura was something that you could see. And then I just happened to be tuning in a program because uh, it was Bill Bixby was the host of some program, oh, yeah. and 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 they and they had this guy on. And this guy said, "I'm going to show you. You know, these people they claim they can see auras. They, can you see these auras? Yeah, they extend five, six, seven feet above their head." And the magician said, "Well, stand behind this. This we're going to have put someone stand behind one of these boards. Can tell me if there's someone there or not." And every one of these people got it wrong, and that magician was James Randi. Yeah. Okay. Whatever happened to that guy, by yeah. the way? Yeah. Um, so, so for me, it was like it was it was like kind of like a, a, a kind of the scales falling from my eyes. I guess I was like, I was like yeah. wow, you can you can actually test that. It's a simple test, and and then I started reading and finding out. You know, curling photography was this or that. And it was still kind of mysterious at that age in, in the seventies or so. But the, for me, it was a slow process mm. of, of becoming a skeptic, and, and the t I didn't even embrace the term for a long time. I didn't know what that was, really. In the example you just gave, Randy wasn't a close-minded debunker. He was open-minded enough to look into the question and test it. And so, so I if, really yeah, appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, if you can do this, then you should be able to do this. And that, right. I use that in the IIG. We use that all the time. If, right. you can, if you can detect this, whatever this is, you should be able to do it under these conditions. And that's, that's, really, that's right. a scientific principle that seems simple enough, but, uh, but it, was, it was a good learning experience. That's great. Yeah. Um, I'll answer my question uh, in two ways. Uh, first of all, I'll say that in, in my past, I was uh, I was not I, I used to not accept uh, the science of uh, anthropogenic global warming. Uh, this was back when I was in college, about maybe oh gosh, twenty years ago, and um, I uh, I was extraordinarily skeptical of any claims about climate change, but I was skeptical in the positive sense of the word, mm. in that. I was willing to be convinced if the evidence was made available. And so, you know, I would see all of the arguments uh, on TV shows and politically and everything, and I was, I, was, I, was never, I was never convinced by any of that. But then what I started to do is in the late 1990s, I actually started to go to the National Academy of Sciences website, and I, I, I literally would download like the 40-page summary papers, and I would read them <laughs> over the course of an entire summer. And because I was scientifically trained and I was also trained to be an educator, I figured I should walk the walk instead of just talk the talk. So I read through this stuff and I slowly started to become convinced, oh, well, maybe there's something to this. And then as I kept up with it more and more and more, I came to basically full acceptance that, yeah, it's, it's perfectly real and it's a problem. Mm. Um, and so in that sense, that's, a, that's an application of how I kind of changed my view on things uh, so you, you changed your mind not because someone came up to you and told you you were a numbskull, not because you, it right. was debunked out of you, but because right. you open-mindedly looked into the question and changed right. your mind based on the evidence. But I th Yes, that's exactly right. But I also think it's important to note that, uh, you know, DJ, you were so kind to us. You asked us, you said, oh, what, 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 
of these you know silly things did you have in your past life? But uh, I think it's also important that we to to note that we still some of us at least still do have well, some silly things in our <laughs> life, and you know where I'm going with this because you can see what I've got on the table in front of me. I, well, I now still, I should read it. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I still no no I still have a I still have one of these silly little beliefs. I'm very superstitious about this coin. It's my lucky coin. Mm. <laughs> oh, I, that's yeah, great. That's yeah, great. No, that happened last year with Jamie in Swiss. Pause <laughs> off. Oh, um, no. it, yeah, if I, it, yeah, he made it disappear. <laughs> and he um, and if I can't find this coin in the morning when I go to work, I have cold sweats. I freak out. Um, We're I, here to help you. Yeah, man. I know. I mean, <laughs> It's just, it's. Well, why are you in the right place? We have medication for so, that now. So it's, you know? it's still. Uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that we're not over that. Mm. We still have the. A lot of us, uh, as I, as I love the way Penn Jillette put it, everybody got a gree gree, and we all still have our own little superstitions that we hold on to, and it's hard to let them go. <laughs> Interesting. That's great. Kylie? I'm pathetic. I fall in love. <laughs> oh, right. oh, beautiful um, answer. Yeah. Um, I used to believe in psychics. I have a relative who was the seventh son of a seventh son, and um, there was a tendency amongst my family to believe in using these powers in gambling. Ooh. And so when I fell in love with someone who thought that these sorts of things are rather dangerous for a person in regards to this, of course, I, I was interested because, you know, you get yourself a partner. They're interested in dancing. You become interested in dancing. They're interested in whips and chains. Things get me even more interested. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but being more interested in, okay, well, why do you think these particular beliefs in, uh, are not really a rational or be safe is, is even more intriguing. Mm. And so that was where it, it led me. And in terms of understanding where other people might come to their rationalizations for odd beliefs or weird things or it's sometimes even dangerous claims. I remember how I fell in love and think to myself, I could have quite easily fallen in love with a con man. Mm. And I could have quite easily continued on down that path. Mm. And people get hurt and sometimes people succeed. And wow. that's, that's what happens. Interesting. Michael, you want to take uh, it? Yeah, so mine's more of a recent one. Um, and that was the supposed rediscovery of the ivory billed woodpecker. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's sort of goofy, and I was in good company. Now, you know, the, it, it made the cover of Science and um, pretty much all the ornithological journals. Um, and it was a great story. So, you know, for those who don't know, the ivory-billed woodpecker, you know, had disappeared in the um, early part of the last century. The uh, last birds were seen and because um, of deforestation. And recently there's a story of it being rediscovered in a, a number of places, but particularly in Arkansas. And um, so it's all over the news. I remember being in the car, and I've always been interested in birds, and particularly woodpeckers. And I remember hearing the story um, on NPR, and I think, oh, it's so great. You know, they rediscovered this bird, and I'm um, so excited about it. Um, and sort of as you really looked back at the story, the evidence for the rediscovery of this bird would have been poor by, you know, cryptozoology standards. I mean, the, the, you know, the Yeti, you know, the Yeti evidence is far stronger. So, um, but you, you had a case, and I think it's a real interesting case, um, I've given some talks on it, that, you know, where, where there's some good teaching points here. Um, and the bird almost certainly is, does not exist in Arkansas. Um, there's 400 cameras on every, focus on every single um, possible perch. Well, woodpeckers don't perch, but, you know, cling to the side of, side of trees. Um, there's audio recording devices down there with computers. And um, so the bird's almost certainly not there. But, you know, I think we had a case where, you know, and this is true for me, and I think this is even true for, for the scientists involved, where people wanted it to be true so mm -hmm. bad, we were sort of blind to the fact that you know, the evidence was really pretty crappy. And um, so it's not a bit, you know, I'm not embarrassed that I, you know, thought the Ivory Bill Woodpecker was back. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I think it's, it, it's a case where I, I you know, um, you saw a sort of zoologist acting like cryptozoologist, and I, you know, was right along for the ride. And, um, you know, it taught me a lot about how you wanting something to be true really has a, you know, a big effect on your perspective. And I think that was true, you know, years ago when I was really interested in, um, you know, UFOs and all these things we've been talking about as a, you know, elementary school kid. And um, I don't know how much I believed in them, but I really wanted them to be true. And I thought, you know, sort of the debunking position, you know, even if the evidence was strong, I thought it was kind of diminished and just sort of a bummer, you know. I, these things are really cool. And I think a world with, you know, Yetis and Bigfoot is, is cooler than one without. But, you know, it's not the way it works. You don't get to, you don't get to pick what's, you know, what's real and what isn't. Mm. I find it interesting that not one person on the panel 
talked about a b former belief that was debunked out of them, that someone <laughs> challenged you on and said it's nonsense or you're an idiot, but you inquired. It was kind of a self-discovery, and that's, I think, where skepticism shines when it's self-applied as opposed to, again, as I said earlier, used as a weapon to clobber someone else over the head with. So we have uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. If anyone has questions for the panel, please line up at the microphone. First question, please. Hi, um, my name is Kathy Smith, and um, I'm not one of those people that's afraid to talk about what they believe in. Um, for an example, uh, one time at work, we had a Chaldean, a Hindu, a Muslim, uh, a Christian, a Protestant, and me, and we all had a very friendly discussion about religion. and. Uh, you know, we didn't argue. I remember one lady said, well, you got to believe in something. Um, so I don't think I'm difficult in that sense, but I'm also one of those people that don't know when to shut up. Um, <laughs> Can you turn that into a question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Isn't there um, a song about that? <laughs> I, I, Just I, joking. I did notice that three people in my lives that I very much respected uh, and admired, they had this peculiar belief, and it, it had something to do with what Matt brought up about global warming. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is something that I never really questioned. You know, it's like evolution. It's something that I always took for granted. I didn't even realize there was a debate over it. So um, I thought, well, and they called themselves skeptics, you know, and so that really had me intrigued. Um, so one person's my husband, so I won't get into that. Um, we're still together. <laughs> Another person is my colleague and um, you know he would present things to me and then I would just totally rip holes in it and give it right back to him and you know he gets really angry and this is like one discussion that is now taboo. You know we don't ever ever discuss it and as long as we don't um, we're fine. Okay. Another one is uh, a friend of mine that moved to Atlanta about a year ago and I was hoping to see him mm. at Dragon Con, and so this is very fresh to me. And um, so I sent him an email about something we had discussed a while back about global warming. He, he sent me, I know, I know, I know. Okay, so anyway, his last email, what's the question? <laughs> his last email was, um, uh, I have put you on my auto-delete list. Wow. Sucks. So, um, what do you do? Very definitely. I know. I'm, 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 this is one subject. I'm, I'm afraid to right. even bring up. Yeah. Well, well it's, it's, I found, w would you agree that the global warming intensity around that debate is even more for some folks mm -hmm. intense than religion? Atheism, yeah. Yeah. theism. Yeah. It's yeah. really, yeah. It, and it's, yeah. I think it's, it's very I think fundamental. As it's skeptics, as media skeptics, so many deniers don't realize how much their opinions have been molded and caressed by public opinion researchers and, and marketers and uh, corporations. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's very intense. Um, I just like to speak to this point because I have, I have a close colleague where I work who is also uh, in this same sort of what you might call global warming denial camp or skeptic in the negative sense or whatnot. And I think what you have to do with people like that is you have to be extremely patient and it's mm. very hard to do mm. uh, I, I find myself so many times you know wanting to face palm but I think w what I have found with uh, my friend is that um, through many careful and, and, and probing conversations asking lots of questions and not making my own assumptions about his beliefs what I was finally able to figure out is that he is not so much down on the science mm -hmm. of global warming as he is the, the potential political yeah. so solutions and consequences mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And once I was able to sit down with him one time, or actually we were in a parking lot on our way to our cars, once I was able to, to, to split those two questions apart, he actually admitted to me, he says, well, you know, I admit to you, I think that there probably is something to a lot of what the scientists are saying. 
but I just don't like this and this and this and this. And I'm like, okay, okay, now we can talk. Now right. we can really work these together. And I think a good analogy. I believe, though, that this, these scientists yeah. are in a conspiracy. Right. And, right. I, and I think right. a good analogy to this is something that Eugenie Scott spoke to earlier is, you know, when you are talking about, say, the issue of creationism and evolution, a, a lot of people who call themselves creationists, in my opinion, are actually okay with the idea of evolution. What they're not okay with is that they've been convinced that if they accept it, then they're going to go to hell or whatever. Well, I think a lot that's of them the also issue. don't know what, it, kind of along the lines of what you were Thank talking you about with your, your friend, problem. a lot of them don't understand evolution, so right. they're actually, they're they're right. uh, against um, a name. Something they were said yep. was, they, mm. they understand was bad. They think that evolution's about the origins of life, things like that, so they have misunderstandings. Right. Right. But I did want to, to, to say one thing about that is that a topic, even if it's something that's very important to you that you feel that you still you need to continue a conversation that you know you can't with, with some people, um, be sure that if you're promoting your ideas that they're they that you're right. I mean, really listen to what the other person has to say, not just to find out where they went wrong necessarily, but, but where find you out might they be wrong. yeah, where you yeah. might be wrong. Yeah. Now, you know, AGW is one of those things that we have a history of of science that slowly built up and we have a consensus about, but there are many things that skeptics will put their feet down about that I kind of go, well, we don't really know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well well said. Um, uh, yeah. uh, all I can say to that is um, I've been in a fight, I've lost a friend, I was in the wrong, and I sincerely hope yours works out. Mm. Mm. Yep. That's I'm all. just questioning whether mm. he was a friend in the first place. Um, well, he might be, and he might very just Very unskeptically, I cross to fingers view. regardless. Uh, question. And I'd like to invite all the, so we could try to get as many questioners. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, quick, a quick question. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have been talking about us educating and us debunking, but should we encourage those educating on pseudosciences, such as intelligent design, to debunk us, such as finding rabbits in the Precambrian? Yes. <laughs> yeah. How how should we do that? How should we go well, about? Well, I think I think a perfect example to make. A, I think a perfect example since you mentioned the rabbits in the Precambrian is when you get a student in class who's like, "Well, how can you disprove evolution?" Right now, I've talked to some of my biology colleagues about this because I don't teach about evolution; yeah. I teach physics. Uh, that's like the perfect example. You, you tell the students, "Well, you know, there is a way to dis there are a lot of ways to disprove evolution." Uh, you know, Tiktaalik is a more the, the Tiktaalik fossil, uh, a transitional fossil between, I believe, amphibians and, and reptiles. Amphi amphibians and reptiles, yeah. Um, that was a very that, that was a very bold claim by Thanks the researchers, and I think that if uh, you know, and that's a good talking point to say, well, look, you know, this is this is a contemporary example of a big test of evolution, and if we don't find a Tiktaalik-like fossil. After looking for it for a really long time, we you know we've got to think about making some adjustments to evolutionary mm -hmm. theory, mm -hmm. and that happens all the time. And so, yeah, of course. And to our questioners, if you have a panelist you want to direct your question to, that might also be helpful. Next question. Hi, I have a question about um, evaluation and formal education. Uh, you can't necessarily evaluate skeptical or scientific thinking with multiple choice tests. Um, so maybe some of you can share some of your favorite methods of evaluating that and how that can be applied on a broader scale. Mm -hmm. Barbara, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, assessments are really, they, they are difficult. You, I'm not a fan of multiple choice tests. There's, a, there's just piles and piles and piles of literature that actually show that it can be damaging. You get false memories from it. Um, it doesn't encourage the right type of, of studying and so forth. Um, in my classes, I use uh, short answer essay questions, and I have to word them extremely carefully, and I have to change them every semester because I learn from what the way my students answer them and every classroom is different. And I honestly think that there's no, um, I don't have any solutions nationwide for us to assess those sorts of things. It's one of those things where you really have to look at an individual student's um, understanding and probe it accurately. And um, that's a difficult thing. It's, it's not very, um, it's not very objective. The most objective thing that I can do is blind myself to to whom is is answering. That's that's it. I, and because I have a large enough class, I can do that. Uh, I'll I'll answer this really just quick. Um, and I, I make no claim to objectivity on this one at all. I the way I evaluate it is I, I look at my kids when they come in versus when they go out at the mm. when they come in at the beginning of the year versus when they go out at the end of the year and, and if so you grade them against themselves no no, no I, I i no i don't i don't actually uh, on this You're on this angle i just i'm listening to the way they speak and everything oh, I and you. and I, I i can tell that with many of them and based upon the conversations they have with me through the year 
that many of them do walk out a little bit more skeptical than they do coming in. Mm -hmm. And if, if that happens, I'm like, okay, that's good enough for me. Oh, that's and good. the conversations they have with other students? Yes, that too. In the hallway that are in the same class taught by somebody else who's been focusing on the same things is fascinating. Well, one can see your influence. A number of your students actually come to events like TAM, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, one of them spoke uh, at TAM. you're casting a shadow yeah. in the positive sense. Next question. Because the content of these sort of nonsense beliefs vary widely from creationism and anthropogenic global warming denial that are clearly pseudosciences to, say, uh, the chupacabra and Bigfoot and all that, do you think they feel the same psychological need to understand reality, or do they each address a different sort of aspect of... Brian? <laughs> Everybody takes a step back uh, Brian to the or Michael, you have a thought on yeah. that? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, probably not. We talked a little bit about... Oops. talked a little bit about... Um, Global warming, and you know, it's obviously you know belief in in or, or denial in you know sort of the consensus scientific view is probably very motivated by you know political um, pressure or um, you know or what are the implications of global warming. So no, it probably you know it's, um, it's not an area I have much expertise, but but yeah, I'm, I'm certain it does in many cases. But there are, there are other things, and and certainly there's re religious motivation for you know sort of. You know, disbelief in you know scientific view of evolution. Yeah. The, uh, one way I've thought about it is some pseudoscientific beliefs fill an existential need, and some are just fun and kooky and mm -hmm. something to enjoy. Yeah. And they're all fair game for skeptics. Yeah. So uh, absolutely. Uh, for many years, I gave a talk on atheism and evolution to, uh, to gifted high school students, and one thing I noticed was this appalling lack of critical thinking, and <laughs> so. I'd, and, and I wish the schools taught this better. And I, so I'd like to ask the panels to take off the educator hat and put on a parent hat, even if you're not a parent, and say, what can we as parents do to encourage our schools to teach critical thinking in a, in a mm -hmm. way that they'll embed it other than just say the dry scientific method? Kylie, do you have a thought on that? Oh, man. <laughs> a thought? Or, <laughs> no, no, pass. A anyone on the panel? Uh, Quick answer. Yeah, I, I have a few. Untie their hands. Mm. Uh, untie their hands. Untie what? parents' hands? No, the teacher's oh, hands. Oh, teacher's hands. Uh, the the, the No Child the Left student? Behind Act needs to go. Sorry? The No Child Left Behind yeah. Act needs to go. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, re the requirements that, that, I mean, this is just something that was put in place for accountability. and. Um, unfortunately, the trade-off is that we now have to develop ways to keep teachers in line, and those ways to keep teachers in line tie their hands and make it very, very difficult for them to even learn critical thinking, much less teach it. Mm. They don't learn how to do their jobs because they're not able to do their jobs. Mm. And um, their days are filled with curriculum. Uh, and it's really only the teachers that are in special programs that even have the opportunity okay. to teach critical thinking. Uh, but the curriculum's there, the points are there, yes. they're part, it's in the learning objectives, but you're asking people who maybe don't even, haven't even figured out how to teach it yet themselves and haven't had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. yeah. You need to untie their hands. Uh, on that optimistic oh, point, we'll go to the next question. Thanks oh, for your dang. comment. And okay. uh, Margaret, uh, you might be the last question, we might be able to squeeze one more. Okay, in. well this question is for Matt. <laughs> Matt. Would you be willing to give me your so-called lucky coin just until four o'clock today to test your superstitious? <laughs> oh yeah, that's good. Oh, All you're testing here is his anxiety level. Yeah. Oh. There we go. Yay! And the lightning bolt comes down and strikes. I've got some spare Xanax uh, in my wallet. That's great. <laughs> Matt, I feel like Matt, shit already. Matt, Matt, this is a, this <laughs> a lucky cap. Love, it's a lucky cap. It's a lucky cap. Hold it really tight. <laughs> Wait, doesn't Richard Saunders have a magic wombat? That's this, great. This is reality. This is not a dream. Uh, a dream, Mr. Inception. Ugh. So if we can, if we can make the one last question very quick and a quick answer, I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Does the balance between education and debunking shift at all in your view in matters of public health where there are immediate lives on the line? Mm. That's a yes. great, great closing point. question. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We have a vaccination Vac clinic. Vaccinate. Pimp it. Blood. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So it's okay to be doctrinaire uh, in questions of public health. Well, we could yeah. basically tell people With overwhelming this evidence. is the position, With overwhelming do evidence. this for the sake of everyone. Yeah. I would say, because I've been involved with the vaccine clinic stuff uh, for the last uh, couple of years now, and um, I would say that, again, it depends upon who you're talking to. If you're talking to 
uh, a parent who's on the fence about whether to vaccinate their kids, mm. you don't club them over the head. You, you, you have to be mm. kind of a little more sensitive to their concerns. If you're talking to Jenny McCarthy or Andrew <laughs> Wakefield, punch them in the head. Yeah, that's funny. You, you have to be worried about the ways the world will end. And yeah, mm. that's, yeah. yeah. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists for this really fun discussion. Thank you, thank you everyone.